<clears throat> okay, so Atsum, number nine, I, 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 I made uh, various editions until I arrive here, but today we'll talk about these works by uh, Diller Ascofidio, the Park Union Bridge, uh, and, and next to it is a museum which they first built, and, and, the, and the bridge was built afterwards, but I will show both, both works. Um, okay, Diller Ascofidio plus Renfro. So designed by the same team as the Adias and US Olympic and Paralympic, Paralympic Museum complex, the Park Union Bridge takes its inspiration from the gravity defying motion of athletes with a 250 foot curved steel structure that floats above an active uh, rail, rail yard. Two interlocked loops stretching from either side of the rail, rail yard connect the museum and America, the beautiful park. The bridge is an exercise in fitness, both in terms of material and geometry. The hybrid steel structure system functions as an arch and a truss, elegantly preserving views from downtown to the majestic mountain ranges of Pikes Peak. The bridge stitches together a growing network of pedestrian bicycle paths including the Pikes Peak Greenway and Midland Trail running alongside Monument Creek with a generous width that safely accommodates pedestrians and cyclists alike. At its widest point, an oculus at other side of the bridge frames the museum and downtown to the east, a platform for, for train spotting below and a distinct lookout to the Rocky Mountains to the west. So uh, on the right is the museum they built, and this is the bridge. Uh, the bridge was, was built afterwards. And uh, after I show um, in detail the bridge, I will also show the museum. And I think they did a good job here. Uh, I, uh, I, I, I made a presentation about them, but these are, ve these are very recent works. For example, the bridge was completed this year, and the museum, I think, last year. And it is elegant, uh, I have to confess, uh, and uh, it's, 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 a, it's a good work they did, in my opinion. I regret there are no students here now because uh, maybe they would have been challenged. You cannot do this kind of work working with a T-square and a rectangle, it's impossible. Why we keep working with a T-square and a rectangle, a rectangle is beyond me. It's, it's, I, I don't understand. We are sabotaging ourselves. You cannot do this kind of thing, even with the mentality of the T-square and the rectangle. I'm not talking about the, 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 the inability to actually draw it, but I, I really don't understand. I am alarmed, actually, because, you know, we all live in the 21st century. We all have the same tools, but we are self-condemning ourselves to uh, remaining behind. Yes, I, I think uh, I think this work has uh, a surprising elegance, and uh, somehow it's interesting this uh, <clears throat> tension, this uh, conflict almost <clears throat> between the, 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 the trains, uh, the trains which are uh, almost obsolete in terms of aesthetics. You will see many of them have graffitis on them and they are, you know, uh, in, in, a, in a state which doesn't show really a forward looking thinking. But this is because in the United States, um, the automobile industry still has the upper hand and the railways, I mean, even these, these are used for commercial purposes, not for transporting people, but goods, so-called goods. So you have this, uh, this uh, in, crossing between the railways and the bridge, and it's a dynamic, uh, it's a dynamic environment. I, I, I really think they did an excellent job here, dealers for video on Renfro. And um, you know, it's a, it's a, it's almost a, almost a, no. <clears throat> I'm sorry, no man's land, but uh, they created a place, a lock, uh, <clears throat> with these two pieces that they uh, designed and, and built. 
Otherwise, of course, is the assault on nature by uh, a human being who cannot uh, stand still in his or her own room and has to run, run, and run again. I mean, just in this picture, we can estimate uh, how much gasoline is being consumed because, you know, despite the fact that, yes, there are some electrical cars now, but most of them still use gasoline. And, and just in this picture, you know, the, 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 the consume is, is, is tremendous. And uh, if we amplify this to the scale of the earth, we can imagine the unbelievable assault on the earth by the human beings. But to, uh, it, uh, several uh, human beings uh, still are able to create things that somehow uh, uh, wash or diminish the, the scenes derived from this uh, 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 raping of the earth. And I think this work, um, although at one po moment I, I, I wrote even violently against them, this was many years ago, but uh, I'm beginning to change my mind. And I think they are getting better, or at least, I mean, Scofidio, he must be 85 years old and uh, uh, his lover, I don't know if they are married, but uh, Elizabeth Diller, it must be 65 or so. And so they are not so young any longer, but the work is, is young, I think, in the good sense of the word. It has a purity, it has a, yes, it is tension. Yes, there is a twisting, but there is also a certain level of aesthetical purity, which uh, I, I, I appreciate. So on the right, the museum, on the left, the bridge. We'll, we'll talk also about the museum. It is refreshing, in my opinion, to see two structures, two buildings that uh, promote the new, and there is a you know, there is a vision here of, uh, and there is a forward looking thinking uh, that uh, somehow uh, uh, gives hope. Because if we look at the rails and then also at some, the wagons, I don't know if I can call them, I mean, look at them. You know, it, it, two different worlds. This is the world of an old America, which doesn't quite care too much about trains. As you can see, these are old. I mean, they still function. But then you have the new structure, the futuristic structure of Diller and Scofidio. And the two somehow, uh, uh, you know, uh, they, they, they mingle. And, uh, and uh, because of the bridge and the museum, you, you are tempted to think that we can still move forward. It's also refreshing to see that more and more people use the bicycle. This is a good thing. So th there is almost a paradox. On one hand, we have buildings that look forward and are almost futuristic. And then we have means of transportation, which are, uh, you know, like the bicycles. They are, you know, rather old now. And, but I think this mixture between the two is, 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 is a good one. Futuristic buildings and, uh, you know, passeistic almost uh, modes of transportation, at least for, uh, you know, individuals.
It is when today it was published on Arch Daily, this work. And uh, today I decided to make this um, you know, short presentation about these two works. I mean, this bridge, this work, this architectural work refuses to be dragged into the pessimism that, that these uh, waggles, these trains inevitably, inevitably makes one think of because, you know, here we have technology, here we have technology, but here is a depressed technology. This is a technology which looks forward and is rather optimistic and it's, it's, it's a good thing that it happened, I think. Now, maybe ideally the trains, the wagons should have had the same futuristic look like the bridge and the, that is not an ideal world. Uh, at one point, the trains in the United States uh, had, uh, were forward looking, but this was a long time ago a very long time ago. And it seems the architecture, at least through such examples, is uh, carrying us on. It, 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 it takes us uh, towards the horizon of hope because of novelty and, uh, you know, the, the, the new aesthetics, so to speak. Also, I mean, this sketch, almost a Zen sketch, if I can call it so, uh, shows the duality of things. On one hand, on the left, culture. On the other hand, on the right, nature. So you have the intertwining of nature and culture, which uh, is always a good thing to, do, to attempt to do. Uh, this site plan is not, um, I mean, here is the museum and here is the bridge. Anyway, now we'll go to, to, to look in detail at the museum. The US Olympic and Paralympic, uh, Paralympic uh, Museum. Uh, so the text description provided by the architects, <clears throat> the US Olympic and Paralympic Museum is a tribute, tribe tribute to the Olympic and Paralympic movements with the Team USA athletes at the center of the experience. The 60,000 square feet building designed by dealers for Fidion Renfro in collaboration with architect of record uh, Anderson Mason Dale Architects features 20,000 square feet of galleries, a state of the art theater, event space, and cafe. Inspired by the energy and grace of the Team USA athletes and the organization's inclusive values, the building's dynamic spiraling form allows visitors to descend the galleries in one continuous path. This main organization structure enables the museum to rank amongst the most accessible museums in the world, ensuring visitors with and without disabilities can smoothly share the same common experience. Uh, the museum is also good, I think, and uh, it's good because it has this uh, this um, implicit uh, spiraling or twisting, and it's 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 dynamic, and um, it, and it even welcomes conflict. And I I I I could venture to speculate that somehow it's an architectonic expression of the of of the conquering of suffering, 
because uh, the Paralympics uh, are about, you know, uh, fighting with terrible disabilities and transcending the limitations. And uh, somehow the building, because of its distortion or distortions, is, I think, able to, to express this. And I think it's a good, uh, it's a good thing and, and, and still remains at the, at the abstract level. It's not uh, literal, it's abstract and, as it is supposed to be. I don't, I don't believe in those who think that the computer destroyed architecture. I don't think it's true. I mean, these things could not have been done easily without the computer, without the digital technologies. I mean, there is a tremendous rigor here. Uh, so, you know, uh, I, I'm not against nostalgia, but uh, I am a nostalgic man myself. But I salute these new techniques because, you know, if we use them properly, we can create things that are worth creating. You would say it's a rendering of some kind of futuristic structure. It's not a rendering, it's, it's a picture of a built work. Now you see it here without the bridge. The bridge really added something to the whole thing. And, and uh, together the, the bridge with the museum create, create a, a, a work which, which has complexity. They also built an interesting um, kind of a bridge. Well, it, it doesn't really cross the water in Moscow. It's a, I, I suggest you, you check it out. It's, a, it's an excellent work. They, they won a competition. And, uh, and uh, I see here, the, it looks like the, the, the bridge was made uh, on, the, on the ground and then it was lifted in its place. So it's during the construction of the bridge that this picture was taken, uh, uh, was taken. I mean, how, how can you do this without the digital technology? Each piece is, has different dimensions and they coordinate and they, you know, I mean, we, for this way you need very precise mathematics and you need a coordination which cannot be done in a manual way easily at all. You see, these are very recent pictures, people who wear masks. So this is during the pandemic uh, time that affects all of us.
So I think this meeting between uh, between the museum and the bridge, which connects the museum, meaning culture, with the park, meaning uh, nature, it is because of this conjunction that that uh, the work seems to me to be to be rich. Because I do believe that that art, in its essence, is about connecting. It is actually etymologically the oldest definition I found for the word art is art equals bridge and in extension equals God. In Sanskrit, this was the, uh, the, the, the meaning of the word art. Art equals bridge equals God. So it's about connecting. And we have here the connection between nature and culture through the bridge. It was a fortunate uh, program, uh, if I can say so, and I think they did an excellent job. Now, I don't know what to think of this sketch, and I don't know who did it out of the three of them. This is not really how they, they, they drew. I, it happens that I knew them and uh, the beginning of the, I mean, I don't know who did this sketch, which we could very well call in Romanian what, or Muscalitura. But, but the buildings they built, the bridge and the museum, are not musculature, they are not uh, scribbles, they are not uh, doodles. You saw them, they are very pure and, uh, and well, well, uh, well, uh, well defined. It's, 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 it's kind of strange that this, this kind of an anxious sketch uh, generated uh, the buildings that we saw. This museum, I think, has a, a positive formative quality, because if you enter this museum, I imagine, you see human beings who suffered a lot and suffer a lot because of their disabilities, but they, they, they fought with their disabilities and they fight with their disabilities and they achieve sometimes amazing, uh, amazing results. And in, in this, I think uh, the museum is, is an encouragement for all of us to transcend the limitations we have, either physical or psychic uh, and uh, or psychological. And, and uh, as such is, is, is uh, the, the function of the museum, I think is, uh, is, uh, is maybe even necessary. Those of us who do not have such disabilities, perhaps it's difficult for us to imagine that the amount of suffering those who have them go through. Now you see here the old and the new. I mean, look, look at these things here at the bottom. You know, this is old technology, extremely heavy and rusted and so on, still functioning, but the but here in between is the new, you know, it's uh, aerial, it's uh, non-gravitational, it's light.
Now, of course, we can talk about what these mammoth things transport. What do they ship? You know, many times, unfortunately, they 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 ship uh, nonsensical uh, non entities. You know, like the myriad of, um, of superficialities that our world is filled with with and 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 uh, you know it's 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 depressing actually to think that so much energy is being spent in order to transport from the left and to the right and from the top to the bottom and all over the world to transport to ship by plane by ship by by train, by you name it, you know, we, we transport things, even Romania is crossed by huge trucks coming, I don't know from where and going, going, I don't know where, but what do they have inside those trucks? You know, a lot of, sorry to say it, unnecessary things. Many of them made in China, you know, and so capitalism is still unstoppable you know we, we we produce 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 in order to consume 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 and and this this these things these containers are exactly about this you know is the restlessness of the human kind you know we, we we move 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 things because we need to to buy 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 and then and, and have and have and have and consume and produce and consume and produce. Uh, maybe it's a, it's a fatality we cannot escape from. Maybe maybe the successes of capitalists depend on this abuse of the earth and abuse of life itself. Interesting also that they, you know they created. Uh, you know, uh, these, these um, you know, areas where you can actually uh, play the sport of yourself within the museum. I think this is also a good, uh, good thing, a good idea. Lots of medals on the right. I mean, we, we could be maybe a little bit uh, sarcastic towards medals, but uh, even the great uh, Norwegian writer, Henry Gibson, loved uh, medals and, uh, you know, all kinds of uh, acknowledgments of, uh, of achievements that he had. Although, of course, they are, in essence, uh, rather superficial, but I guess we need them. Anyway, it's a good building and uh, I'm happy they built it. It's a museum which is not static and uh, it shows people move, you know, they go to the museum like where some kind of a vortex of energies and, and uh, it's a good thing. And of course the, the architecture matters, the building matters. This, this reality that it is possible to integrate within society people who suffered and suffer is, um, is something very positive, you know, that it's very important for, for these people to feel that they are not, uh, you know, unable to, to integrate themselves within life. And so um, efforts to, 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 to welcome them 
in any way possible are, are, are uh, worth doing. Okay, so now we go to um, uh, Mr. Vignola. Uh, it will be a little bit difficult because it's, it's really a, a long distance between what we just watched, we just saw, and, uh, but um, perhaps in the dialectics between what he represented and still represents and, and, and the present, maybe something interesting could come into being. So Giacomo Barozzi da Vignola was born in 1507 and he died in 1573 on July 7th. So today there are 448 years since he died. He was a contemporary of Andrea Palladio. In fact, Palladio died in 1580, seven years later. And it is said that Vignola and uh, Sebastiano Serlio and Andrea Palladio were the three architects who uh, promoted, in a way, uh, the Italian Renaissance. Well, it was late Renaissance, but Vignola is considered actually a mannerist. Uh, and uh, even uh, Palladio emancipated himself a little bit through, from the so-called classicism or of, of the Renaissance, but all in all, Serlio, Palladio, and Vignola, they are considered to be the three Italian architects who uh, spread, uh, you know, the spirit of the Italian Renaissance uh, outside of Italy. Uh, this is uh, an idealized, I imagine, uh, engraving. Um, most of the time, etchings and engravings are. Uh, I, you know, idealized versions of uh, the one they depict, and usually done later than um, they, they, they are not really contemporary with uh, with uh, with uh, the ones depicted. Anyway, this is another version, but maybe there are some resemblances. I don't know. Anyway, Vignola, the one that Le Corbusier hated immensely, and I still don't know, as I said, why he hated. While Le Corbusier hated uh, Vignola. He was one of the great Italian uh, architects of 16th century mannerism. His two great masterpieces are the Villa Farnese at Caprarola and the Jesuit Church of the Gesù in Rome. The three architects who spread the Italian Renaissance style throughout Western Europe are Vignola, Serlio, and Palladio. Drawings. He published. Um, you know, uh, important books that, that were almost uh, like the Bible for, uh, for architects. He wanted to, to facilitate the, the usage of um, so-called classical architectonic elements. Uh, and uh, apparently he was very successful. Uh, maybe that's one of the reasons why uh, Le Corbusier hated him, because he was so successful and uh, Yes, I could understand perhaps that uh, Le Corbusier was against this codification of architecture, which 
risk of becoming dogmatic and maybe it did. But uh, so the, the published work of, of uh, Vignola was, uh, was uh, very didactic. Perhaps his, his most important work is exactly this one, the theoretical one. But he also built, and we are going to see some of his works. Of course, we, we don't work like this any longer. We moved away from, from the classical orders, uh, thanks to transcending postmodernism. Now, Villa Giulia for Pope Julius III uh, in Rome, 1550-1553. Here, Vignola was working with Amanati, who designed the Nymphaeum and other garden features under the general direction of Vasari, with guidance from the knowledgeable Pope and Michelangelo. A medal of 1553 shows Vignola's main villa substantially as it was completed, save for a pair of cupolas. It's not very clear to me what, what he did because there were various architects who worked there, but uh, you know, for the moment we have to to have just an overview of the works and they might not be very precise, but uh, even as such, I think it's an information which might uh, lead to further, further knowledge. Now, it's interesting in a way to compare these works with the, the works we just saw by uh, dealers, Cofidio and Rempo. Can we compare them? Why not? But by doing so, we compare the 21st century with the 16th century. I wonder what Vignola would have thought of the works of dealers, Cofidio and Rempo. Oh, by the way, tomorrow I will talk about Philip Johnson. It will be his birthday. Not one of my preferred architects, but still, I, feel, I don't think we can ignore Philip Johnson. I think this was done by Amanati, no, not, uh, not by Vignola, but it's part of the same complex. So this is Villa Giulia. Now we, we, we go to the, this important work by him, Villa Farnese at Caprarola, 1559-1573. Um, he died in It's like a fortress. Um, 
I mean, it has a lot of windows, but uh, it's an enclosed uh, uh, building. Villa Farnese at Cabrarola. And it does look like even in plan, like a, like a citadel, like a fortress. The geometry is very strong, it's very deterministic. And if you compare it with the fluidities of Dealer's Cofidio and Renfro, you see two very different conceptions about space, about aesthetics, about uh, you know, uh, what, what it means to have a dynamic architecture as opposed to a static architecture. But there are virtues in both. Uh, is this famous spiral staircase within the uh, the building? Now here somehow we connect over the centuries with uh, what we just saw in the work of Tiller and Scofidio because there is fluidity here as well. The spiral is fluid. So Farnese at Caprarola, Vignola. The spiral is about becoming, and uh, what we see here on the right is about being. So the being is static, and the becoming is dynamic. It's process. So you have both here, being and becoming, stability and instability, because the spiral could be described as being rather unstable. I wonder what Vignola thought of Palladio, his contemporary. I think as an architect who built uh, Palladio is superior to Vignola. But Vignola had his role, didactic as it was.
Now, if we look at the elevation of this building and we remember the elevations of the building by dealers Cofidio and Renfro, we see indeed a, a great change. But they are both on Earth. They are separated by 450 years or so. Uh, and uh, yeah, perhaps it's interesting to, to, to look at history in a dialectical way and in a com comparative way. But in both works, there is art and the capriciousness of art and the beauty of art. And we need art. You can't have architecture without art. Villa Lante at Vanyaya, 1566 onwards, including the gardens and the water features and casino. So I guess he did also the landscape design or the garden. actually two buildings identical and then the garden as you can see is quite uh, quite large uh, these are the two buildings he built and they are identical here also we have like in the works of Dilara Scofidio and Renfro nature and architecture or nature and culture or culture and nature. No, but we should we should perhaps mention first nature and then culture. Now, the buildings are rather stern. They are gray and uh, static and uh, they are cubes, two cubes. But, but the gardens display a different spirit. Uh, there is the arabesque here and uh, the ornamental um, exaltation of the garden is not really present in the buildings, but they need each other. Architecture needs the garden and the garden perhaps needs the, needs the architecture. It's an interesting work. This is a rather recent um, rendering. It certainly didn't belong to Vignola, but it represents the plan or part of the plan of the garden. The buildings are rather small compared to the garden. I mean, here they are. And, uh, you know, we kind of reverse this. Um, relationship. Uh, the buildings in our case are big and the gardens are small. But on the other hand, the realities of our time are different from the realities of that time. Here you had an aristocrat, or whatever he was. Uh, you know, uh, actually, I was wrong that the, the, the two buildings are here and I see here other two smaller buildings. So the garden, I think, is, is, is both on both sides of the buildings. I wonder what these are. Anyway, um, 
a perfectly symmetrical plan. Now, this church in Rome, the mother church of the Jesuit order, which would become a source for Baroque church facades in the 17th century. And this was built in the 16th century by Vignola. And I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a good, uh, it's a convincing uh, facade. would be interesting perhaps mainly because of these elements. I don't know how they are called. I should have known, but I don't because Alberti uses them in, uh, in uh, Florence as well uh, and Santa Maria Novella. It would be interesting to compare because Alberti also worked on the facade of that church in Florence and to compare uh, this work by Vignola with that work by Alberti. Also, I think it's interesting to mention that um, the deconstructivist Peter Eisenman is now obsessed almost by Alberti. He is 80, he will be 89 years old this year and he's studying uh, frenetically uh, Alberti. And I think he even published or is going to publish a book on Alberti. I find this very beautiful and very inspiring that uh, one of the seven deconstructivists who uh, exhibited at the Museum of Modern Art in New York in 1992 or 1993, is studying now at 89 Alberti, the, para, the, you know, the paradigmatic uh, Renaissance uh, polymer. I find it very beautiful. And those who throw stones at the constructivists, they don't know or they ignore the fact that they are actually very well-educated architects and not uh, indifferent towards the history of architecture. I, I attended myself five lectures by Eisenman on, on, Albert, on uh, Andrea Palladio. I, I, I will be honest, I didn't understand much from what he said and I attended all of them, but one thing I did understand, he had a great interest and passion in, uh, in uh, a great interest in, in, in Palladio. I wish, I wish uh, we can learn from, from such people because uh, really architecture cannot be moved forward without uh, immersing yourself in, in, uh, in everything actually, you know, to, to study the work of Hiller, Scofidio and Renfro, to study the work of Vignola and Alberti and Palladio, to study the work of Eisenman, learn, 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 and then create, create, create. And truly, I think on the spiral of time, although the forms, the external forms differ, the buildings by dealers for Fidio and Renfro differ from the building by Pignola, but, but on the spiral of time, perhaps we can see certain uh, common elements somehow. After all, there, there is a fluidity also in, in Vignola. We saw the spiral case at the, the Farnese Caprarola, Cap, uh, Caprarola building. Uh, so, you know, and there are static elements also in the architecture of Pilar and Scofidio. So between mobility and immobility, between the static and the dynamic, there is a conjunction and there is a conflict, but it exists. It existed and continues to exist to this day. This announced the Baroque, but you know it originated in the 16th century, and uh, you know the the the, the 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 exuberance of the Baroque was uh, was only anticipated. The facade itself is not uh, 
is not fully baroque and is rather static and flat. He didn't do the paintings, of course. This is Baroque art indeed. But again, going back to what we saw at the beginning of the presentation, that those two works by dealers Cofidio and Renfro, the fluidities of life although the museum was about, uh, you know, uh, people with, uh, with disabilities, but it was still about transcending the mobility in which a disability forces one into through, uh, through engagement, through, through physicality, through mobility, and through, through a dynamic way of life. Here, we also see a, a lot of dynamism, you know, so again, the spirit, the human spirit uh, doesn't truly really change. The forms of manifestation change, but in essence, you know, we, we are not different from the people of the 16th century. And in art, as it was said, there is no progress. There is no progress, art, at its best is rather eternal. It, it, you know, the, 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 the theater of the Greek ancient uh, culture theater is as relevant today as it was, uh, you know, more than 2000 years ago. And this uh, was known very well by Freud, who wrote about, uh, the, you know, the Oedipal complex. So art doesn't age if it is good. Technology does age, but uh, art doesn't. I think a good contemporary artistic work would have been understood by someone in the 16th century or the 6th century or the 6th century before Christ. But it has to be good. Tremendous ceiling here. Guess wrong. Now the Basilica of Santa Maria degli Angeli in Assisi. Um, Vignola with this architect Galeazzo Alessi. Now the side elevations are different from the front elevation. Usually the front elevation received more attention and it has the complexity which the side elevations don't. So it seems Vignola only had some interventions, perhaps in the in the main facade, uh, and the, the, the building was, was uh, projected by uh, or designed by Galeazzo Alessi. I don't know who he is, but uh, he was a contemporary of Vignola. He died uh, four years before, after Vignola died in 1573. Just like the churches by Andrea Palladio, this church also within is rather, you know, uh, so-called clean or white. Another church of Santa Andrea and Via Flaminia in Rome, the first church to have an oval dome, which became a signature of the Baroque. Yes, the Baroque used the spiral and also used the ellipse as opposed to the circle and the ellipse, which has two centers, 
as opposed to the circle, which has one center, is dynamic. It's also about becoming. And uh, this is a good building. I like this building by Vignola. It's very austere towards the outside. I mean, there is a little bit of so-called design in the front elevation, but otherwise the building is almost uh, Adolf Loss-like. The only uh, discrepancy or accident here is the oval of the of the drum, and uh, that that and you feel it. You feel it's not a circle. I think it's an interesting building. And, 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 and it is considered Vignola a mannerist architect exactly because he used, you know, like in this case, the ellipse or the oval and not, it's not a cylinder based on a circle. They will see clearly in the plan. And you might also approximate it as some kind of a very simplified version and much smaller of the Pantheon in Rome. But the Pantheon works with a circle and even the oculus is circular while here is, is the ellipse. So uh, it anticipates somehow, uh, even though the primordial uh, uh, inspiring figure might have been uh, the Pantheon, here we see uh, an invitation for Borromini to come in and uh, Borromini did come in and he, he built that beautiful church uh, San Carlo alle, alle Quattro Fontane. It is very moving for me to see this 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 uh, evolution, but not progress. It's not about progress. This 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 changes on the spiral of time between various kinds of art that uh, express. I mean, this is very important, and uh, it it was known, and it is known what uh, Maria Olbrich wrote on the facade of the Secessionist building in Vienna to each time its art, and to each art, to art its freedom. So we cannot mimic, we cannot repeat, we cannot copy what, what, what was built in, in, in a different century or uh, even some years before us. We have to be true to our time and express our time. And in order to express our time, we have to have freedom. Interesting little building by uh, Vignola, if I can call it so, little building. I still don't understand why, um, why Le Corbusier hated him. The last image of this presentation, uh, which is only an introduction in the work of Vignola, will be from, uh, um, from uh, the, the work by Le Corbusier, Le Poème de Longue Le Trois, with that page where he uh, mocks uh, violently uh, Vignola. But this work, I mean, it, in a way, it's, it's very modern. Palazzo dei Banchi, Bologna. A different kind of work altogether. A palazzo, it is indeed. Bologna. Italy has so many riches, it's unbelievable. Every town, every city, every village has uh, jewels. Kind of strangely small windows here, tiny you know, compared to the ones above. Sorry about this, you barely see anything, but that's all I found about this palace. So Palazzo Farnese in Piacenza, this was a grandiose project of a vast palace on a scale paralleled only by the Vatican Palace in Italy. 
the rectangular plan is, you know, approximately 111 meters by 88 meters. The actual construction, however, made up only less than a half of uh, Vignola's original project and lacked many of the planned architectural features. Missing elements include part of the exterior surrounding walls, the main facade modeled on the ancient triumphal arch and with a large tower and the theater in the large inner courtyard. Again, a fortress-like building. Um, maybe, maybe this part of, of, of the work of Vignola irritated Le Corbusier. I don't know. I don't have enough knowledge to to know why he was so furiously um, attacking attacking Vignola. Maybe, maybe I'm I'm only speculating now. This this uh, this uh, hiding behind of a fortress-like building, it's like uh, just at the, the uh, building that Caprarola here. Also, it's it's a it's a massive building towards the street, so to speak, towards the society in a way, and and behind it we see fragmentations, but. That those fragmentations are not shown now. Maybe the fragmentations are because the work was not finalized, was not finished. But the building is massive, massive, and then and, and the fortress like this one as well. Now, I will end uh, this uh, introductory presentation about Vignola, who died on the 7th of July, with this page from Le Poème de Longue Droit by Le Corbusier, where if you know French, you will be able to read what he wrote. J'espère sous ce titre, uh, no, j'apprête, j'apprête, uh, j'apprête sous ce titre, la maison fille du soleil, et vignol enfin est foutu. Merci, victoire. Now, for Romanians, the word foutu is not very difficult to understand what it means. Can you believe that Le Corbusier actually used this word? Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, you know, what did he want to say here, you know? And, and he, he criticized Vignola in, in, in another, at least in another place that I know of. But this is part of the major work he did, the Le Poème de Longue Le Droit is one of the pages and that they are in too many, uh, where he obviously uh, proclaims a victory over uh, Vignol. La maison fille du soleil. Um, did he mean that Vignola uh, was not interested a house, in a house which was the daughter of the son? I guess he was uh, attacking Vignola because uh, Vignola was codifying architecture. But I don't think uh, poor Vignola was against the idea to have a house which was the daughter of the son. Maybe Le Corbusier was, 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 was emphatically uh, uh, opposing uh, uh, the dogmatization of architecture and uh, the, its estrangement from, uh, from the primordial natural or even cosmic forces like the sun, maybe. And the woman also, you know, a uh, vital presence uh, and uh, absolutely necessary one for, for, for life. And so we have here on the right the two trajectories of the sun at um, uh, the summer solstice and the winter solstice. And then we have the uh, feminine silhouette. Uh, and uh, she is not probably Nefertiti, but but maybe uh, uh, she might be a relative of Nefertiti. And then Le Corbusier, uh, in a in a juvenile uh, or teenage-like uh, proclamation, saying "A vignol enfin est foutu." Merci, victoire. So that's it for today. Thank you for uh, for being here.